those of you who are familiar with Epic, have you done, you've had a recent rollout or you're currently in an implementation? Okay, yes, shaking heads. So the next step is going to be talking about some of the drama that we've kind of experienced and, and a lot of it is how our leaders have worked through that. Um, so I'm anxious to, to see what you guys have to say about some of those pieces. So implementation really is the training phase. So how do we train all of our caregivers in order to be successful utilizing this new system? And then our final phase here will be optimization and that's really looking to monitor what we know and then obviously continue to improve that as well. So some of the challenges that we've seen that have led to the drama, right? So for us, the first few are is going to be focused a lot on staffing because we, we really wanted to prioritize for us utilizing as much of our internal staffing and that expertise as we possibly could. So our very first ask was to determine 150, roughly 150 designated internal project staff. So we went to all of our departments and asked for them to please provide the best of the best because these were folks that were going to go and receive extensive training would, would need to pass a rigorous assessment in order to utilize and build within the EPIC system. So these folks were pharmacists and clinicians, um, non-clinical staff, doctors. So as you can imagine for our teams, this was a painful process, right? We also will be having 650 internal super users. So what's a super user? They receive additional training beyond end users. So just like our internal project staff, those 150 that were identified back a year and a half ago, these super users are physicians and nurses and other clinical and non-clinical staff. Um, and we're, we are asking that we have them designated to this role to provide at the elbow support for up to a month as needed after go live. So again, we're asking for teams to provide the best of the best in order to make a successful implementation at go live. The other piece of this is we have 4,200 end users. So end users means those will be folks within regional health who will be trained on utilizing that system. So 4,200 is a pretty big number. And for those of you, because I think some of you indicated you were leaders, so that means scheduling, right? Scheduling their time for training, but also how do we work around the workload and the schedules for our teams? The next piece there is we have and had 60 external consultants. So we utilized their expertise to guide us through our, our build in, in the early phases of the project. So that doesn't seem so bad, except when you think about where will they work? And maybe more importantly, where will they park? Right? Parking? No? Yes, maybe? Um, so that was a big, a big um, painful point for folks. Uh, the next piece, kind of along the same lines as those 60 external consultants, is 365 consultants that will be coming in to assist. And their, their role will be specifically um, specialist training specialists. So they're going to be all across regional health markets in those over 40 um, healthcare healing environments providing at the elbow support for all of our clinical staff at Go Live. And they will be here for uh, a week or two providing that additional support. So same thing, where will they, where will they be, where will they park, where will they stay? all those staffing and scheduling issues that can sometimes cause a little pain. The final one is competing priorities. Do you guys ever have competing priorities at your organizations? Right. So that was a big one, especially early on, earlier in the phases of the project. You know, how can we do these other 20 plus priorities while also ensuring that we are, are working and are all in on our epic transition and implementation of this project? So that was a big piece for leadership is was determining rather than saying I can do this or this, changing that mindset and saying I will do this, these other priorities and also prioritize the EPIC implementation. So that was a, a, a huge one as well. This last piece is project staff retention and staff planning for optimization. So we've roughly asked for almost a thousand internal caregivers 
to be um, leading the way with this project, designated project staff in various roles, whether it's building the system, training on the system, being additional trainers, um, and really without um, refilling those positions. Instead, departments were re they restructured and they refocused through this process to be successful with the implementation. But now that we're nearing optimization, what is the plan for that staff retention and the staff planning? So we're working closely with leaders to identify that process, and we've implemented a couple additional systems that we're going to talk about a little bit today that are helping with that, that planning and optimization, not just for staff, but also for uh, departments as well. Do you guys have any questions on this piece? So what are some of the things, if you were in any of these situations or for those who have already been through, what are some of the things that you heard as far as storytelling or drama that maybe have come through from your teams? Yes. Trying to get physicians to training. Yes. Is always a difficult right. How are we going to schedule it? And then is there someone else that's going to go to training with the physician to, to help them perhaps? Yep. Other things? Yes. You have the knowledge in house. Yep. So making sure they understand the why behind it and not that they're just off having fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Other things? <coughs> All right. So, really, when we were work working through these, these um, pieces, this next step is as we know from size work, the best way to diffuse that drama is through self-reflection. And so as a leader, these are the types of questions that we need the answers to. I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie just to walk through another example um, before we wrap up. Perfect. Thanks, Joey. Uh, so as Joey said, these are the pieces, these are the questions that we really needed our leaders, uh, their teams, our support staff, our administrators, uh, we needed them to be answering these questions when they came to us uh, with drama surrounding losing nearly uh, a quarter of our staff at one time or another without refilling those positions um, and still maintaining awesome patient um, outcomes, awesome financial outcomes. Uh, when they brought that drama, including some that you guys just mentioned as well, we needed to know from them, instead of all the storytelling, instead of all the, oh gosh, don't you know my situation, I can't possibly do this and this, please choose one. When it wasn't choose one, it was choose like 38, right? Here are your 38 top priorities. We needed them to really get to a place where they could answer, okay, when the storytelling, storytelling happens um, out loud, it's called venting. Anyone ever experienced venting from anyone you work with? Right? <laughs> um, so when storytelling is verbalized, oftentimes it's called venting. And while it feels really good, um, it's our ego preventing us from really self-reflecting, um, which is where we need to be for great accountability and great solutions and great results. So we needed our caregivers across the entire system to come to us, and, uh, to come to us with what they knew for sure. What story were they making up about what they knew for sure? Um, what could you do next that would add value to this situation because it's not continuing to vent, right? Um, my very favorite, what would great look like? This is really in the reality-based philosophy and real reality-based leadership, the ideal state to get to as a leader. That you know you can ask these questions, uh, hardwire a new mindset, a new way of thinking, better mental processes, to a point where eventually the staff underneath of you come with these questions answered. Um, it's a pretty awesome place to live and work. Um, the answer to these questions is where true empowerment really comes from and when a new, better state of co-creation can exist. So the answers to these questions, if we can get ourselves and our caregivers answering them, they're your simple instructions on what to do next. And then the empowerment comes of, great, go do that. Go be great. So how do we do this? Like, easier said than done, right? Um, first, we have to work to eliminate some of the venting. And it's a bit of an awkward process. If you've got, right now, maybe an open door policy. Any of you have the open door policy? Any of you ever had one of those, uh, like a caregiver, a leader, a staff member come in, maybe your leader, and give you one of those, like, hey, knock, knock, knock. Do you have a minute? Conversations? First of all, know that that person has probably just lied to you. 
right? Because what's really the case with that? Oh, knock, knock, knock. Do you have a minute? A lot of it's a lot of minutes, right? <laughs> it's a bunch of minutes. Um, so Sai offers several tools. We're going to work through one of them today that we found through the Epic implementation um, and go live um, and what's coming next after that to be really successful. And it's the SBAR tool. Many of you are familiar with SBAR tool in finance, um, sometimes in quality outcomes as well, but size really flipped it to use for relationship building, uh, for ditching the drama, for getting to a place uh, where we really have, again, a better mental process, better results. Um, and it's something that you can use with your team. You don't have to call it an SBAR, uh, but it's something that you can use with your team or your leaders, or your leaders, leaders underneath of you, uh, to get them thinking a little bit differently. Again, eventually, if we do this enough times with enough consistency, you will develop an environment where empowerment exists, accountability exists. They don't have to walk away and answer these questions and come back anymore. They'll just start to think this way. We've seen it happen. It's very exciting. But how do we get there? So the SBAR tool is a really simple tool. Sai has many others. If you visit her website, you'll see tools like thinking inside the box, which at first I was like, oh, that hurts to say out loud because we're taught so much to think outside the box. My very favorite is negative brainstorming. Um, that tool has been very successful for us as well for ditching some drama, getting people into self-reflection so that great results can happen. But the SBAR exercise is really great. Um, and we're going to use, we're going to kind of walk you through a real life example that happened at Regional Health um, that was related to the EPIC project, but really is related to uh, staffing in a nursing department, uh, staffing and scheduling. A couple of you already mentioned that. Who in the room has experienced drama venting ego when it comes to scheduling? Yeah, OK. <laughs> I'd like to say good, but I know it's not good. So the SBAR, what's the situation? This should be one to two sentences about what's really going on here. What do we know for sure? One or two sentences. The background, how did we get here? Again, one or two sentences. What I love about giving it that constraint of one to two sentences is there can be no drama there. And many times, while your caregivers are hardwiring this new way of thinking, you'll have to give them something like this or give them an assignment like this and actually ask